Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman, and I am your host. And my guest today is Peter Woodbury. So Peter got his undergraduate degree, psychology degree from Harvard. He got his master's in social work from Boston University. He is trained in hypnotherapy and past life regression. He is in private practice as a psychotherapist and hypnotist with a focus on the use of spirituality and faith as tools for personal transformation and liberation. He is also a student of the Edgar Cayce readings, has been a student of them for over 30 years. And the association that is committed to carrying on the work with Edgar Cayce's writings is the Association for Research and Enlightenment. And actually, that's what we're here to talk about today. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Big pleasure to be here. Uh, so, you know, in doing a, my research, there are so many different ways that we could go because it's endless. And maybe you could just say, I, most people have heard of Edgar Cayce, but maybe you could just say briefly, if you could, like who he was and why we should pay attention. Well, he was um, born from in rural Kentucky. So and he was born with um, certain psychic abilities that uh, were really not much explored until in his uh, 20s, he lost his voice. And then through hypnosis, he was able to regain his uh, speaking. And this was a kind of an unusual experience because they started asking him if he could do what he had just done for himself for other people. And this is what became called readings. Edgar Casey would go into a trance state and he could give a reading most of them were for people's health. So if somebody was ill, he could um, uh, both diagnose the illness and then prescribe the treatments for him. But then he also gave readings about what we call the new age. And I think that's particularly most relevant to, uh, to what we're going through in modern times. So I wanna talk about that in a minute, uh, but I just wanted to, you know, I had watched a, doc a documentary about him and you know, one of the things that I didn't know was that this was not something he sought after. It, it was even troublesome to him because it was a gift where he could see people's illness and diagnose it. And of course, people were flocking and demanding. And from what I understand, he had a hard time saying no. And so he would continue to do these readings. And you know, one of the things that I thought about when I heard that it lost his voice, and I'm just making a, a leap here, mm -hmm. but it said he was going to go out and sell insurance with his father. And I thought maybe that was the universe saying, mm, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You can't sell while you can't speak. So maybe mm -hmm. it was just redirecting him to this path. Because then, as you say, he underwent hypnosis, he saw the issue, and it sort of resolved itself. But um, as, and one of the things also that um, he was a man of faith and uh, read the Bible maybe 68 times from what I understood? Yes, at one time for each year of his life. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And so I want to talk a little bit about the new age, but I want to talk about past life regression because typically that doesn't fit into the Christian model. And um, yet when he reread the Bible, from what I understand, he did see some things that pointed to that concept. So in your work with people and past life regression and the work that he did, what was the purpose or use of that? Well, he, uh, a couple of ideas I have. He was, like you said, he was a devout Christian. And so he made a promise to himself with this reading business. He said that if he ever gave a reading that hurt somebody or that went against his Christian beliefs, that he would stop giving reading, readings. And so when, when reincarnation came up as a theme in his readings, he took pause and it took him a while to, uh, to reconcile Christianity with reincarnation. And we're not really sure exactly how he did that, but certainly there are passages in the Bible which can be interpreted insinuating the possibility of uh, reincarnation. And you do that with people? Yes, it, it, Edgar Casey gave two main types of readings. They were all the, either health readings or life readings. And in a health reading was basically somebody that was ill who you know, couldn't get, uh, you know, a conventional doctor wasn't able to, to help them. And so he worked mostly with those folks. And so those were two thirds of his readings were for uh, 
medical or health conditions. But when and then you the work, other, go ahead. Wait, I'm yeah, sorry. And, <laughs> when you work with your patients, clients, so you know you're a therapist, but you're yes. using a spiritual model. And yes. what I gather is you do use past life regression. Right. So, you see, what used to happen with, with Edgar Casey is that you could go to him and he would access something called the Akashic Records and he would bring forward uh, uh, three or four past lifetimes that were relevant to what you were dealing with in this lifetime. So it would point out perhaps your strengths and it might point out some challenges that you've had or patterns that you're dealing with from past lives that are playing out in this life. And what I teach people to do, or what I've learned how to do, is that we, you don't have to go to somebody else to access the Akashic Record for yourself. You can go into trance states and access that yourself. You see, I think Edgar Casey had to go into quite a deep state of trance to access somebody else's Akashic Record. But I think our own personal Akashic Record is not very far. Like, I think of it like there's a central library which has many, many books, and you might have to drive into town to get to the central library. But each of us may have a little personal library in our house. And I think that's our what I would call our personal Akashic record. And there you can easily access relevant past lives. Wow. And um, so this is not, you know, there are some people who take this very lightly. Oh, you know, I, I, anytime I've ever talked to people, you know, they talk about past lives. Uh, everybody's been a queen or a king, you know? It's like, <laughs> okay, how many kings and queens were there? And how does this impact you in this lifetime? So I'm assuming you've done past life regression for yourself. And what's the, what have you integrated from that into your current life? Well, you know, there, it, it, a regression will help you or open your eyes to a lot of different things. You know, there's, there's some personal issues. You know, a lot of times it's our families that represent our soul group. And so there's issues within our family that are patterns that we're trying to work through. And then sometimes you have readings that go into kind of bigger themes like like work themes like like dynamics in past lives that are repeating themselves now as a focus of your professional work if i could give you examples of both of those or, or one of each if you like yes well the, the i did the the training with brian weiss you know brian weiss wrote many lives many masters so he's kind of the 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 you know, the well-known yes. yeah who brought uh, past life regression into public uh consciousness. So I went to his training and the backstory is that I have a sister that um, I wouldn't think I had any big issues with or big karma with, but the only, the, the, if I looked at a family picture from childhood and I saw her, I might wonder who is that? And then I'd say, oh, that's right. That's my sister. So it's a little bit odd. So I, I was never terribly close to her. I was close to my other brother and my sister, my other sister. But then um, as she grew up, she was a little too close to my mother. And so she married a man who kind of set the boundaries. And, you know, when that was going on, I thought that was fine. But then he started to set boundaries with everybody, with her own son. And so I was kind of uh, upset by that. And, and maybe more than, I don't know, it was really upsetting me. And I remember talking to a friend about it. And, and when you're at the ARE, you have these new age enlightened friends. And he was telling me, well, why can't you let it go? Why can't you just love your sister the way she is? And, you know, it was kind of like good advice that you just want to, like, hit them. Yes. <laughs> and so, I, yeah, so I just, I, um, I knew there was something there, but I wasn't quite sure. So just, I did a regression at the Brian Weiss training, and I saw myself going to prayers as a priest in Ireland. And I was not happy at all. I didn't enjoy the experience. Going to prayers was very rote. There was no life in this uh, kind of monastery. And so the person regressing me, asked me, how did I get there? Then I saw myself as a four-year-old or a seven-year-old boy with a little suitcase being dropped off at the orphanage. And I look and see my parents and it's my sister and her husband. And wow. I got it right away wow. that I was holding on to that resentment. But the healing aspect was, I realized that in this life, I was holding on to the perspective of the little boy, but I was also in the regression. I was able to experience my sister's feelings. And I could tell that she was torn up, that she had 12 children. She, she couldn't feed all of them. It wasn't personal. And they thought that I might be the strongest one to be able to handle uh, growing up alone. So I didn't know that as a little boy. But then I also realized it was Ireland, and this was happening to many children. So again, it wasn't personal. And so seeing it from that oneness perspective really helped me heal. 
I realize that we get injured by our separate view and the healing comes when we take in the larger perspective. I, when I came out of the regression, I called my sister and you hadn't talked in a while. I said, you want to get together? And she said, well, I need to check with my husband. She called him back. You know, she called me back and she said, well, he wants to join us, but we can't talk about all these issues. <laughs> and I, the, old, the old me would have said, well, I'm going to talk about each one. But this new one, this new person said, OK, well, let's just get together and talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. That's so really I, I interesting. Say, yeah, I wouldn't say they're my favorite people, but right. I don't feel any toxicity. I feel like I bless her. And, and it was some there was almost like a karma that I had that I wasn't even aware of. Yeah. And that's very powerful because sometimes just and I've had those moments just seeing the information kind of liberates you. Yes. And as you say, you know, one of the things you talk about, like they're not necessarily your favorite people. And um, in something where I listened to a talk I think you were doing, you uh, mentioned Martin Luther King saying, you know, you have to love everyone. But the really great part is the following line. You don't have to like them. You know, as human yes. beings, we have preferences. Yes. So you may prefer not to hang out with this person. But as you say, you can still bless them. You know, go ahead, yes. live your life without the binds of resentment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then I, I think that that's one of the main reasons of reincarnation is these these resentments and grudges that bind us. And I think once you once you've let those go, like I think forgiveness is the master law of grace. Once you forgive, forget, let go, then at some point you can choose to incarnate or you can go on to the multiple, you know, infinite schools of, of other places in the universe. Right. So. Um... There was a question that slid in there. I'll, I'll get back to it. But um, can yes, you said uh, that we could do this on our own. So how do people learn to do this on their own? Well, you know, it, it's a little bit, you know, Edgar Casey was very connected to Jesus. And so there's a lot of themes in Casey's material that are Christian that read. I was raised Christian, so I resonate with them. And I remember how Jesus said, I don't want to bring, give you fish. I want to teach you how to fish. And so when I do a session with somebody, I accentuate the process for them unconsciously so that I'm emphasizing that they know the way to get there. And then once they've had the experience, I give them a lot of post-hypnotic suggestions about continuing this process, that they come back often, that there's more here for them, that they know the way to get here. And so in that way, the person can leave the session and more easily do this on their own in their own meditations, yeah. which is what I do now. I'm able to do... A kind of trance or regression work through you know, individual meditations. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, so I'm going it's to. Not a, it's not a great business model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you're here to serve, right? Um, well, yeah, and I, I also travel a lot, so I, I do a lot of <laughs> one of sessions. Yeah, and I think that it, even that, yes. So uh, I wanted to ask you again, uh, you know, the whole concept of the new age. Uh, you know, so on a, you know, I, I can shift and dance in between spiritual and uh, seeing that they're, you know, we're in this karmic predicament, but we get a say and we tap into the spiritual and we tap into the whole oneness, whatever. Uh, and yet on a daily human level, it's like my heart hurts when I see children being ripped from their parents, you know. So what do we do with that? Well, you know, I think that um, I, I don't think the model of enlightenment is to not have your feelings. You know, I think it's the it's to have your feelings and then not necessarily get overwhelmed by them, but uh, make choice, you know, make um, spiritual choices about how you're going to deal with those. You know, so is, you know, I think we are being faced with a lot in our country that's very, very upsetting. But in some ways, you know, it's is there a purpose to what we're the horrors that we're seeing? And is it in some ways to do things have to get really bad for before we wake up? Because I think that that, you know, like Buddha or, or, or Christ, it's really a, it's a process of awakening. And, and sometimes we don't awaken when the water is lukewarm. Sometimes it has to either be freezing or boiling. So I do think that a lot of what we're being confronted with is to make us uh, make stronger choices and to be more active in changing our world. So I have a question about that. And, you know, I'm not, uh, this is just a personal question at some level. So um, 
you know, I get that. And I certainly am a believer in karma and, yes. you know, all of that and this whole awakening and spirituality. But if I look at history, it's like, you know, what are the lessons that we have to keep learning over and over again? I mean, Hitler existed. You know, did millions of people have to die to in order for somebody to awaken? And did we awaken enough? And there's a there's a point that you reach and you go, OK, so what's the point? Well, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, like spirals. And so, you know, I think that if you look at if you look at a spiral from a certain angle, it looks like a circle, like it keeps repeating. Mm. But I do think that there is an evolution. And you maybe, you know, all of us would like it to be faster. You know, we wish it was a straight line, but it is a, right. I think we revisit certain things. I, I think that since we're we're conscious now, I don't think we know what it would have felt like 100 years ago, 500 years ago. I do think that there is a spiritual evolution that's going on. You know, I think things, they, they, there's not linear, there's little ups and downs, but I think right. if you look at it consistently over time, I think we're becoming more spiritualized as a as a society i'd like to believe that and <laughs> you know i i'm not um uh, i grew up kind of exploring religions so uh, i don't know a lot about christianity i d i did go to parochial school because i grew up in the woods in canada and that's what what, what yes. existed but um you know i i heard somewhere and i i love this context that you know, without Judas, Christianity could not have existed. Mm -hmm. We need a Judas. And maybe this is part of what Judas is, is all these challenges that help to awaken us. But in terms of the new age, so one of the things that you said in, your, in one of your talks was that it, it's now more of a collective awakening, that it can't mm -hmm. be just I'm awakening. Mm -hmm. So can you say more about that? Well, I think that um, one of the benefits of the, the, the time that we're living in is that it's easier to access higher dimensions of consciousness. Now, if you don't try, you don't know that. You just, it just seems the same. But I think that like with the work that I do, it's easier and easier to get people into higher dimensions of consciousness. So I find that very helpful that if we, you know, I think that uh, the way that consciousness rises is each one of us is like a balloon. And if we each of us raise our consciousness, it collectively raises the consciousness and helps us. I think that we're moving through a time where we're trying to transcend what you're calling the, the old age is the selfish and greed kind of uh, mentality. And I think that sometimes, you know, just like the Christ, I'm going to speak uh, personally, this is not a, a Edgar Casey A.R.E. Right. view necessarily. I just want to make a disclaimer that this is my okay. view. But just like the Christ had to be, in some ways, the the highest had to die the death of the lowest. I so think that the Antichrist also has to, the lowest has to be raised to the highest to get the the attention. Mm. So I think right now we're seeing the way, just the way that the Christ was brought into collective consciousness. I think the Antichrist. By Antichrist, I don't mean like an individual. Like the Christ is a consciousness of, of love and peace and sharing. And the Antichrist is the opposite. It's selfishness. It's greed. It's me. You know, Casey defines the Antichrist of lover of self, lover of you know, self-aggrandizement, self lover of strife. You know, all those things that, that we're seeing in our time. There's kind of a lot of uh, abrasiveness. We're not thinking collectively. It was... We were trying, and then there's, there's been this pothole that we've kind of fallen into. It does. Yeah, that's a good description. And, you know, I, so one of the things I do, I'm a life coach. And so this, you know, people kind of have this aversion uh, when they hear lover of self. And really, self-love is a significant piece yes. of, you know, your expansion. Yes. Or maybe so, the small ass as opposed yeah, to the, the big Yeah, the small ass. ass like, yeah, yeah the, the, the ego. It's all about ego. me. And... Yeah. Um, so do you have, and again, you know, we're kind of going between Edgar Casey and your personal perspective, but your personal perspective comes out of all of that, um, mm -hmm. as well as the other things that you do. Um, so one of the things the common conversation one hears is about technology. And on the one hand, technology is not going anywhere and it's done extraordinary things and we can do extraordinary things with it. And yet at the same time, 
it, it, it seems to be out of balance. So if I look at it, it's like it is separating us. It is more of us versus them. It allows people to look at life like a movie, which allows people to video someone drowning instead of saving them. Yes. So how do we deal with that and stay conscious? Well, I think that um, like a, a rule of thumb that I operate with is that nothing is all good and nothing is all bad. And I also think that that every new generation, the older generation, thinks that they're going to hell in a handbasket. You can, you know, every my generation, we were the losers, and now we look at the next <laughs> one. And so, so I, I think in some ways we have to entertain what is being uh, shown to us, and what are we, um, what are we learning in this situation? And so, just like that spiral mm -hmm. I talked about. I think that we have been, if you if you talk to Edgar Casey, we've been at a place where technology has been used for the destruction of the planet. But the thing is, is that that, that has to be revisited. So I think we're at a time where we're re revisiting technology with the potential for it to destroy the planet, with the hope that it doesn't, that we use it for good rather than than for uh, destruction. You know, he talked about Atlantis was a time of high technology that they, they eventually destroyed their continent with, uh, with technology. And so Casey said a lot of the Atlanteans were reincarnating in the 20s and 30s, and they've been part of this boom in technology. But hopefully we don't destroy our world again. You know, I think that each time we learn and that there is a progression, hopefully. You know, we all have to do what we know best to do to make these things happen because we've been here before and it hasn't gone well. No. So, uh, and I love the, the visual, I, you know, I've heard that, but when you really bring it into focus, the whole thing about the spiral, it's not a circle and it's not mm -hmm. a straight line. Um, so people watching, you know, so, you know, what is it that you can say to them? Like, here are some tools, here are some places to take a look. Like, again, I think, you know, people, f I think are longing for a sense of, meaning and you know sometimes we call it purpose and sometimes people get stuck in oh what's my individual purpose but just about living a life that where we feel like we have meaning and significance what would you say are things for people to reach for well you and I seem like we're about the same age I mean we, we remember when when you used to have to drive around with a map you know you yeah. just kind of get lost and you're trying to read the stupid map you're driving with one hand well, nowadays we have GPS. I don't think I'd know how to get home without the GPS. You know, <laughs> so now we have a system which uh, ties into a satellite and that guides us. You see, I think we have our own GPS. If you want to learn how to make things easier, you know, you can go around life with a map and it's very hard. Mm. But if you tap into your higher kind of guidance system, mm. it's much easier. So I think that for me, the key is really learning how to do kind of uh, work, you know, the, the easiest is meditation so that you, you, you re like if, if you over identify with this flesh suit, the end of this story is not going to be good. <laughs> you know, whether you live to 70 or eight or 90, at some point you're going to be, ah, you know, you're, it's not a pretty story. How this <laughs> ends. So the over identifying with this is going to be a lot of anxiety and stress. But if you attach also to an eternal part of you, that really helps you kind of, you know, that this too shall pass, you know, you, it's not about being passive. We all have to keep doing what we're doing. But I think sometimes, you know, like if there's a crisis in a in a situation, like crisis at a movie theater, you know, there, there's somebody there that has is keeps their head straight and helps everybody through the situation. So I think that that if we're going to get through this time, the more of us that can keep our head straight through the crisis, the better and more likely we are to get to the other side. So I just think that if to answer that question easily. I mean, the, the simplest answer is make sure that you spend some time developing a connection with your higher source. Or otherwise, you are going to get caught up in a lot of fear and anxiety and stress that, that can be avoided. Yeah. And wow. I think when you talk about a higher self, you know, there are some people who uh, think that that has to be a specific religion, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, the, uh, something other than your flesh suit, <laughs> as you describe it. And, and most of us have experienced some moments where, where we just without invitation access that and feel this connection. 
and perhaps it's just nurturing that so meditation is one of the ways what else um well there's uh, near death experiences but i don't recommend those <laughs> that's yes. a joke <laughs> we'll try so to I, avoid those no i think um dream work is very helpful you know anything that gets you into you, you set your ego aside and you can get more pure transmission of soul energy and that, that's why I do uh, hypnosis work, because I think hypnosis work is a very effective way to get your ego aside and get soul energy to come through. And, you know, th that's not so esoteric. That's not so difficult to reach for. And I think every one of us who's listening to this has access to that in some way. And I mm -hmm. think what you're saying is just, just reach for something that takes you even slightly above the current you know, stuck in your body and in the physicality only. I mean, just just today, a man came in to see me and uh, you know, he, this is this week is the Congress at the ARE. So we have people from around the world that are coming here. And this is a fellow who's um, you know a good old boy from Arizona and has had some curiosity about Atlantis. And so he came in to try to have a regression to find out what was going on. And he, for about an hour and a half, had very strong energy going through him. He was shaking, and he felt that there was some weight that he was holding that was removed. And then he got a transmission of uh, information that he didn't want to share. It was very personal, and that was fine. And his wife and, and family were there, so perhaps it was just something private he would share with them later. But that's the sort of thing that if you if you open yourself up to this, there's tremendous amount of... Uh, you know, I, I think that most of us are, are living our lives uh, without the GPS on. We're just wandering around. And just like Jesus said, I come that you might have life, not just life, but life more abundantly. I really, like, that's my gospel. I think that there's ways that you know, I try to facilitate people accessing their own inner resources and so that they can live an easier life. Well, we are actually at the end of our time, so that's a perfect place to end. <laughs> So, Peter, thank you so much, and I invite people to check out ARE, to get in touch with you if they have questions, yes. and um, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.